Welcome to The Road Home with Jamil Giovanni. Many of you will recall the Unite the Right rally organized in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017. It made international headlines because it brought back concerns about what an extreme right-wing influence can do to the United States, partially because of the rhetoric used, the divisive, hateful worldview that was articulated by rally attendees, but also because of the violence that occurred. A counter-protester was killed by a young man who drove a vehicle through a crowd of people. And that was not just a, you know, I think a a turning point in how a lot of people were thought about the threat posed by what has been described uh, in many cases as the alt-right, the alternative right, the extreme white nationalist, white supremacist element of um, right-wing politics. But in my case, it was the first time that I was ever asked to speak about white supremacists and white nationalists as radicalized young men. I actually spoke uh, to probably, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20 radio stations after that tragedy. And they wanted me to explain, kind of like how I have in other media, as it pertains to jihadists and Muslim youth, what was happening in the lives of young white men that would lead to such violence, that would lead to such radicalization, that would motivate a young man to not just attend a rally like what occurred in Charlottesville, but to get behind the wheel of a, of a vehicle and kill a person. And I think what surprised a lot of the radio hosts that interviewed me across Canada was that I was speaking about these young white men in many of the same terms that I would anyone else, that there is some sort of maybe common thread between the types of radicalization and violence and, and hateful movements and violent movements that, uh, that exist uh, in North America, and that the motivations... Uh, that young people find to join these groups actually transcend many of the differences that they're so uh, focused on. That sure, uh, uh, a white supremacist and a jihadist probably think they have very little in common. And they, they, in many cases, would hate each other. And yet their experience as isolated, lost young men looking for belonging and purpose and a way to explain their frustrations and the unfairness of the world is actually very similar. In the process of doing interviews uh, for my book, I came across a young man, Maxime Fisset, who shared this understanding. He, too, wanted to explain radicalization among young white men the alt-right, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, in terms that would show how similar they are to other radicalized youth. For him, it was coming from the other end, where he knew what the far right was like. He had experience being a neo-Nazi. He had experience working as a propagandist for far-right political groups in Quebec, and had even been arrested for inciting hatred in Quebec before. But the reason he wanted to explain to other audiences who had never maybe had those experiences or didn't know someone who you know, ran in those circles, that their struggle is actually comparable, similar, identical, uh, in some cases, to the struggles of other youth, is that he saw how assuming differences between groups of people feeds the kinds of division and intolerance and hatred that extremists thrive upon. 
the more you break down those barriers and you create a common narrative, a common conversation between extremists of various varieties, that is in in and of itself counter extremists. That is counter radicalization. That is saying actually your divisive conflict oriented way of understanding the world is not the the basis through which we are going to analyze and interpret what's happening here. Maxime inspired me because I had never before seen someone who was willing to own up to his past as a as an extremist and a a white supremacist in the way he had uh, it just it it actually startled me in some case in some sense because he was just so open about the hate that ran through him and why it was important to him and how having a child caused him to rethink some of his basic assumptions about the world and motivated him to consider a different way of living and a different way of thinking about his place in Canada. Um, so I, uh, have kept in touch with Maxime since I first met him. And when I was in Montreal to, uh, have conversations about my book, I made sure that I could sit down with him and finally meet him in person where the conversation we had was happening at a time where he was being interviewed by a number of Francophone journalists about a documentary that was being made about his life and the transformation he made from a far-right extremist to someone who now works with the Center for the Prevention of Radicalization Leading to Violence in Montreal, where he works to help young men leave the kind of extremist groups that he was part of once. So this conversation is happening at a time where he had been telling his story over and over and over again. He was under this intense microscope of people who wanted to look into the details of his life and ask him questions. And I, and I saw in him the kind of, I think, vulnerability and frustration that comes with people no longer seeing you as a person, but instead seeing you as a story. And that is, I think, the the, the starting point of our conversation, which is I didn't want to ask him to repeat a lot of the the talking points that he had been giving to other, you know, to other folks who were interviewing him. I wanted him to feel a little human um, on a day where I could sense he didn't have that. And so in our conversation, you'll see we talk about what it's like to be a public voice talking about these really complex and difficult subjects and a person who puts your, in some cases, your life on the line to try and combat uh, evil forces in our society. I hope you enjoy the conversation I had with Maxime and you find it as informative as I did. So I'm catching you at a really interesting time in your life where you have a film that's about to come out. Yeah, tell about that. <laughs> called La Bombe. Can you tell us about the film and, and, and what it's about and why it's keeping you so busy right now? Um, it's a project I've been working on for over a year and a half. Um, it's a documentary uh, on the far right in the province of Quebec only. Um, and this movie uses my personal story as a former neo-Nazi as a backbone to explore and question what's going on right now because uh, several people, including myself, uh, have had a hard realization uh, a couple of years ago when these far-right groups started appearing uh, on the political map and everybody was like, well, so this is going on again. And lots of people seem not to understand them pretty well. They don't know what they stand for, what their real ideas are. Um, they don't know what's motivating these people. So um, by by making this movie using my story as a, as a backbone, we hope to uh, really help people understand uh, first uh, what's their motive, then uh, how it could become uh, a nest of radicalization, what we call agents of radicalization. And we ask the question, are we sitting on a time bomb? Uh, 
I'm still not sure that the time bomb uh, expression is the best one. Um, forest fire seems more appropriate here, but there clearly is an issue uh, with nationalism and racism in the province, and not only here, but in several countries as well. And, and so this, the, the movie tries to address it without stigmatizing these people, because we really wish to understand them. But also, the movie tries to explain to them and to gener the general public why, as a former neo-Nazi, I... Uh, take to myself the right to speak of these groups that are not neo-Nazis, as for most of them. Well, I, most of them are not neo-Nazis. Hmm. How do you feel becoming even more kind of public and known uh, about these things? Like, I mean, you're, you were, you know, we first met, um, after, you know, or first conversed, I should say, um, on a radio show. So it's not like you're new to the public. Uh, sphere, you're not new to the spotlight, but you're only kind of growing in your notoriety. Is that hard, like, to be known for your past involvement in these groups? And how does it feel that more and more people are going to know this part of your life? Um, at first, it was, it was pretty hard. When I started, uh, you know, people started calling me famous or celebrity. That still bothers me today, but it really did much more back then. And at some point it became easier, but now it's becoming hard again because I, I'm starting to realize that uh, for like months, people have been talking about me without me noticing, of course. And some of them have been saying things that very bad things, like there's lots of rumors about me. Uh, 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 some rumors say that I was uh, involved in hate crimes, like uh, beating people. Uh, some rumors say that I'm, I'm an undercover Muslim. Uh, some rumors say that I'm a drug addict. Uh, some rumors say that I'm... Most people think I'm stupid. Like, that's kind of weird. So I, I, I really don't get where all these things come from. Uh, but they really seem to... Uh, to become more and more, uh, I'm not going to say mainstream, but common in the far-right circles. Um, I, I'm seeing these comments quite often, and I, I'm not going to say that it really saddens me or surprises me, but it gets uh, kind of exhausting, so uh, I, I, I don't... I'm not going to say that I wish I could go back, but uh, I certainly wish I was more prepared to this kind of backlash, because it's really exhausting. And is your hope that as you open up more about your past involvement in far-right radical groups and you talk more about your story that you will kind of dispel these lies and these rumors and, and, and people will better understand who you are and what you actually believe in today in 2018, 2019? That's what I thought at first, but it was not counting on the lack of honesty uh, from some agents of radicalization. Um, some of them think that I'm paid by George Soros to spread lies about them. Some don't even know what a neo-Nazi is, but they think that the Antifa are the real Nazis. See, they really lack a political culture. Um, I feel that the more and more I speak, the more and more rumors there will be. So I suppose I've got to live with that, but I don't know. It kind of saddens me sometimes. Yeah. And people don't even try to get to know me, even though I'm, like, very easy to contact on Facebook and I answer, like, every single message that is not spam or hate mail or threats, so... Well, and part of, you know, your accessibility online is part of your impact, right? Like, people find you and they're looking for a fresh perspective, people who might need help, advice for how they themselves can leave radical groups. I mean, in some ways, the more vulnerable you make yourself, yes, you are, you know, subject to, you know, people who want to disparage you and misrepresent you, but you're also then also more open to people who need you, right? It's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, I guess. That's right. Although it's... Um well, I, I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, far-right groups today do not realize that they are far-right groups. So when a neo-Nazi comes and talk about them, they feel that um, they don't understand why I talk about them. That's true for most of the older people. The, the younger far-right activists clearly know where the affiliation is. They, are, they completely understand how my previous mindset and their current mindset join. But the older ones, they don't understand that. They, they don't see it. And that that's 
partly why this movie is good and important because I think that they are going to understand better after it, after they watch it. Hmm. So, I mean, what, what kind of comes next in your career? Your story has been so fascinating to me and I've had the privilege of interviewing you for my book and just kind of like getting this sense of this path you're on that is so unique and I always wonder like where does this kind of take you right I mean you've gone from being part of these groups to now helping other people leave these groups you're a leading voice in Canada and in other countries on uh, de-radicalization and on countering the influence of far-right activism um, where do you think, you know, the, this film might take you next? Where do you see yourself going next? Actually, I have no idea, like totally no clue. I, I'm just starting to realize the impacts this movie, this film may have. I really never thought about it before. Right now I'm working on, uh, fiction, like, um, something that's going to talk about hate, violence, racism, and poverty and gangs. Uh, I hope it's gonna work, but for the movie, I, 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 what I hope is to achieve uh, maximum distribution. I hope that people all abroad, everywhere in you know, French countries are gonna watch the movie and say, so this is going on in Quebec, this is pretty much like what's going on in our countries, and some people are taking a stand against it, and maybe some, maybe we should do the same, you know? I, I also hope that it's going to embolden the former community. Um, we're a small group of formers. Some of them have uh, pretty public careers as well, uh, but most of them don't. Uh, and most of the time it's because they fear, um, you know, they fear that they're going to be stigmatized by most people for what they have been. And I, I found that when you sincerely and eagerly speak of your past and apologize for it and try and repair what you've did what you've done people are more often than not eager to forgive you that's mm. something i really wish is going to transpire through my movie the the formers that you you refer to um is that a is that a community that is kind of supportive of each other yep. uh, yeah and yeah and do you, is that a community you think um, is also helpful to, I guess, creating more formers to helping more people leave? And yes, um, when you see that change is possible, it's much easier to embrace it. <clears throat> so when you are thinking of just disengaging because you don't really fit into the mold anymore, because you want to change perspective, and you see a former, you might think. Oh, so I could actually do something else, like really be someone else. Uh, and I know that for lots of people, that not really me because I really am a loner, but most of people uh, need a, a supportive community to help them leave these groups. Well, I just needed a family, you know, to call my own and a place to live and a job to do and, uh, you know, courses to take in college. Most people are going to need support from people who have lived the same thing. And that's why, that's where former communities are so important because uh, you speak to a person who can relate on the deepest, most personal level. And that's just like the Alcoholics Anonymous, right? You, you get a much easier time, you know, opening yourself and feeling understood when you talk to a person who can totally relate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, most of the people who hear uh, this interview are not going to be, you know, kind of francophone. They might not know French at all. And yet I'd like for them to w watch this film. I want them to see it. And, you know, with the gift of subtitles, maybe they can also follow along. Mm -hmm. Um but part of why is because I think it's important for English-speaking Canadians and other English speakers around the world to better understand what is going on in Quebec. I mean, we're a very fragmented country, it feels, at times, where we don't always know what's happening on the other side of the nation. That's true. What would you, how would you describe <laughs> the kind of the, the, the environment here in Quebec? Like, is, is far-right activism uh, a big issue here? What does it look like? How... For folks on the other side of Canada who might not, you know, engage with French media, for example, how could we explain why this conversation is so important here today? 
Well, as a starter, I think it's important to say that Quebec is not more racist than any other province. Like, it's one of the most open and tolerant societies in the world. But there are some issues, some, um, some unresolved issues in our past that make us more vulnerable to certain discourses. Uh, one of these issues is, of course, sovereignty, separation. Um, the 1995 referendum, you know, its failure was a, um, a big cynical push for lots of nationalists here to um, not necessarily disengage with nationalism, but to create a more defensive type of nationalism. There's also the, um, the issue of secularism. Uh, most people here in Quebec uh, have a hard time understanding what secularism is. They have a very French Republican view of no religious symbol whatsoever in the public space. So it's kind of more like, I don't know, public atheism more than secularism. And they have a hard time understanding, uh, m you know, multiculturalism, uh, which is much more Canadian than Quebecers, uh, because, um, they, they also feel that multiculturalism is a threat to their identity. We all, we all know that it's not a threat. It, it, per, it allows every community to be emboldened. But this national issue has made everything Canadian more, you know, itchy as a subject. So it's also something that is quite... Um, quite risky here. And there's been the issue of the refugees at saint bernard de la uh, south of Quebec, uh, coming, coming from the United States. Most people did not understand why these people were coming uh, in Canada and why they were welcome. Um, <clears throat> and that really created another um, polarized issue. And far-right groups use these polarized issues to attract members and to radicalize them even more. So you, you had the Islamic State, you had the, the refugees, you had terrorism, you had secularism, you, la you had separation. All, all these issues have contributed to the rise of this far-right. All of these issues need to be addressed and discussed openly and, you know, honestly among everybody. But far-right groups are using them to recruit and radicalize people. And that creates a context in which no other province has a 45,000 strong uh, far-right group. We're the only one. Why? Because some people are more sensitive to these discourses and agents of radicalization are very good at using them to recruit and, you know, have their word spread. Um, is that also, like, does this type of radicalization kind of feed off of and or contribute to other kinds of radicalization? So if you've got this stronghold in Quebec, is that then maybe, you know, is that is that interacting with, you know, let's say jihadists or far left activism? Like, are these groups kind of feeding off of each other? Yes, a lot. Um, radicalization is a global phenomenon that takes its roots in local context on individual levels. So it's, it's pretty complicated, but essentially when the context is ripe, say Donald Trump gets elected, far-right groups get emboldened. Uh, but they also get emboldened by the rise of the Islamic State that became the main threat to democracies for a couple of years in the media. And so this creates a far right. In opposition to this kind of backlash against Muslims that is inevitable when the far right rises, some Muslims are feeling targeted and they are uh, operating some kind of, um, how do you say that, a repli dans style. They're, they're just folding back to themselves on, on the identity level and some of them are becoming more and more vulnerable to radicalization. Some of them have left to uh, you know, to go uh, join the Islamic State, which in turn also emboldens the far right. And then the far right becomes public and everybody talks about it, and then the far left rise up again. And you have the perfect storm for a real mess for some people to get beaten in the street or uh, for some crazy guy to shoot a mosque, right? You, you, polarization and sensitive issues embolden every type of extremism. Yeah, we, it, it, you know, these are all these like big global things that are going on. How do you, as you know, one man in Quebec, um, make a difference when it's like you can't control, you know, what's happening in Syria. You can't control who's the president. You can't control 
all these big things. So how do you exercise your agency in a way that, that pushes back against these forces? Making sense. Um, there's only little one person can do. Uh, I can't do that much, although I must admit that I'm privileged that I can do that much. Uh, helping pe people make sense uh, of some things really helps. Um, you know, injustice may be real, all right? And it's also always very good to question whether or not some systems are unfair. Uh, but some things need to be taken into a broader context. And to make sense of the world is something that helps reconcile with it. It doesn't mean that uh, one person has to totally disengage. It only means that radicalization happens uh, when the feeling of urgency is fueled by perceived injustice and violence happens when this feeling meets, uh, let's say that... Uh, it, when it meets uh, the verification of non-violent actions. When you help people make sense, the feeling of urgency becomes less strong. And when you help them find new ways to engage without violence, the verification is, uh, let's say, curbed down. So that's something that we do to help. We help people make sense. For example, when we have some... Um, some youth that are dealing with some Islamophobia, for example, they are feeling that, for example, Muslim may be a threat. Uh, we're not going to throw them at, at an imam. We're going to pitch them to some university teacher who knows everything there is to know about political Islam. And when they come back from this meeting, they're like, look, I may not have all the facts, but my view is, is much more nuanced now because I know that I don't have all the facts. See, that's something that we can do. And then when they want to get in, involved into something, we can give them creative project to work on. So right now we're, we're releasing our, um, how do you say, Bandesne, it's a, it's a cartoon, not, not a cartoon, it's, it's a, a comic book. Comic book, right. Yeah. We're releasing this comic book uh, about far-right radicalization. Well, it has been made by, well, the story is the, the one of Formers. And we've released two others before, and they had been made by people who had struggled with radicalization in the past and who needed some way to uh, engage without being violent. And creative, creative activities like this one are something that they really uh, rejoin with these people. They, they resound with these people. These people are happy to get engaged and involved in these projects, and they really have lots of leeway in doing them. And that helps them, you know, kind of, reconcile with the world because they, they know they're making a difference without having to resort to let's say um, less specific ways of engaging yeah you know you remind me of uh, some friends and colleagues i've had who <laughs> um have left uh, street gangs and and part of one of the things that i see is similar in you is you know your work is um I just, I, I feel the exhaustion, right? Because you're, I feel like it's so personal. Like you're putting yourself out there. So much of your strength and authority comes from the fact that you've experienced these things and gotten out. And now, you know, you're almost reliving a lot of these moments when you're talking to people. And, and, it, and it feels like, if I'm being honest with you, like I, I want you guys to, I want you guys to win in terms of, you know, having your voice heard and I want young people to hear you, but I also want you to be he like healthy and careful. And I want you to be, you know, like, I don't want you to be, you know, dried up in the process, you oh, know, that, that's totally going to happen. Yeah. And so, but uh, that's what I, I want to like, like, how do we, how do we, to put this very crass, like, or bluntly, um, how do we m use your skill set and your strengths in the best way possible without, you getting exhausted along the way and eventually having to say, like, I've given so much of myself to the world, I can't, I can't keep up with that. Uh, I know my boss really tries hard, yeah. but at some point I, just, I, know, I, I know I'm just going to snap and, like, spend three months in my bed drinking <laughs> soup. <laughs> I, I'm planning it for January, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I'm kind of exhausted right now, and I, I, I can feel the burnout coming uh, pretty fast. But... Mm. Um, there's this powerful drive, like there's nothing like it in the world. Like you cannot possibly know this feel unless you've lived 
this feeling. It's it's so emboldening. Like, um, do you know the concept of ikigai? It's a Japanese Zen concept. Yeah, elaborate. Like, you've got to be at the intersection of what you're good at doing, what you like doing, what allows you to earn a living, and what makes a difference in the world. There's nothing stronger than at being at this crossroad. That's ikigai, and that, that's what farmers are. You know, when, when we get paid doing what we like, what we're good at, and what really makes a difference, it's... Well... <sighs> there's n no stronger drive possible. Even when I was a radical, I, I did not feel that drive. It was not that, that hard. It was not that strong. I was just driven by the feeling of injustice, while right now I'm driven by the feeling of reparation and discussion and rehumanization that's like totally different but so much stronger. Mm. And that makes it all kind of worthwhile at the end. Oh yeah, I suppose that burnouts are not eternal. I'm gonna mm. come back afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> After some, some some soup and some sleep. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, the movie hasn't uh, hasn't come out yet. It comes out next week. Yeah. Um, what are you hoping viewers leave with? What's the kind of main message you'd love for people who watch the film to to come out with? Questions. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope that viewers will come out with more questions. Um, you know, my director and I, we don't agree much. Uh, actually, we're like pretty good friends. But when it comes to these far right groups, he has this much more, I'm not going to say nuanced because I think I'm pretty much nuanced. But he has this very protective view of these groups because he knows and he's right that most of the people in these groups are not actual far right activists. They don't know what they're, uh, you know, engaged in. While on the other hand, I know uh, for, certainty, for, for certainty that uh, agents of radicalization are using the goodwill of these people to, you know, promote hateful discourses and polarization and the rise of, you know, neo-fascism. So what I hope people will get from this movie is uh, more questions and mostly more, um, you know, uh, how do you call that? The principle of precaution. The principle of precaution, I suppose. Um, that it's when you've got to be more careful about an issue because the externalities may be very dramatic if you don't. So uh, let's say the far right. Uh, if you deal with it, um, I'm not gonna. I, I don't know how to say that. We've got to talk about it and call a cat a cat. This is a far-right movement that's going on right now, and it's not only going on in Quebec. And, you know, my director says, you know, these people are just like our uncles and aunts. Like, they, they have families, they have jobs, and they're just people who are scared, but they really want to change things for what they feel to be the better. And I'm like, yeah, just like the ones who voted for Marine Le Pen in France. Like, that's basically the same thing, but you don't have... Any, any problem calling Le Front National a far-right party, right? So, because it's closer to us, because uh, it's people we know, people we love, it must not allow us to disengage from opposing what is going on right now. It's the normalization of racism, and that's freaking bad. Like, it's, it's totally bad. Like, if there is one evil in the world, and I don't believe in good or evil, racism is this evil. So... I hope that people are going to watch the movie, come out with more questions, but with one certainty, we must be careful with these groups because they have an hidden discourse and a hidden agenda. That's something that the movie portrays quite right. Is that why you think the appropriate metaphor is a forced fire instead of a time bomb because of how it can gradually grow to destruction as opposed to suddenly become... It's both. I mean, you've had this guy in my hometown who went and killed six Muslims. You had this guy in Pittsburgh who went and killed 11 Jews. That's These people were time bombs, just like I was back then. Luckily, I did not resort to violence, but they did. But it's also a forest fire, because if we are not careful, I really sincerely fear that all of our, you know, 
democracy and all of our liberal societies could be swiped again by fascism. I can feel it coming back. I know, I, I mean, I, I've been caressing fascism in my heart for years. I mean, I know it personally. It's like I've given it little cute names at some point in my life and now it's coming back, but it's not a cute little bunny. It's like a frigging big dragon that's engulfing almost every Western country in its flames. And people have a hard time calling it a dragon just because it still doesn't fly. But it's, you know, it's still burning stuff. People are getting killed because of these ideas right now. And you know the Paradox of Tolerance by Karl Popper? Yeah, it says that uh, too much tolerance kills tolerance. You cannot tolerate intolerance at a certain level because it is going to destroy it. It's going to destroy the basis on which tolerance exists, which is liberal democracies. So if we're not careful... No, actually, we are seeing it right now in Brazil. Like, Bolsonaro could be the first fascist elected president uh, in the 21st century. That's kind of scary, I guess. Like, I, I am scared. Mm. Maxime, thank you very much. Pleasure. Appreciate it. You can follow Maxime on Twitter at Maxime M. Fissette.